Hi, I'm Aaron Newworth with Vetify. I'm joined by Chris Humer, Senior Investment Strategist at FlexShares Exchange Traded Funds. Chris, how are you doing? Great. How are you doing today, Aaron? I'm doing well. Let's get this thing going. The current market environment has been rough for all investors, but income-seeking investors have particularly had it hard as global bonds have had one of the worst openings of the year on record. Can you provide some context here? And are there any alternatives that income-focused investors should be considering? Yeah, Aaron, uh, I think that's that's perfect. But let's put this in, in context a little bit. Uh, so year to date, uh, from a bond perspective, uh, you know, global the global lag is is having uh, the worst year on record since since 1976, uh, which is I believe when uh, we first started tracking uh, global ag pricing. So uh, it, it's off to a, a, a very poor start, uh, and and even uh, U.S. Treasuries are off to uh, the worst total return year since I, I think a similar time frame. You know, in, since the late 70s. In addition, we've seen bond volatility increase significantly since the beginning of last year. To put that in context, uh, the move index, which is uh, similar uh, from a volatility standpoint, the, I, I view it as as uh, the fixed income equivalent to the VIX index for equities, uh, increased over 35% uh, since the end of last year. Uh, and it's now uh, been consistently above uh, 110. So you've seen this, this increase in fixing of volatility. All of this really goes uh, in into what you would expect in an inflationary environment. One of the things that uh, I, I've been talking about a lot is the difference we see in, in stock and bond correlations in deflationary and inflationary environments. In the de deflationary environments like we've been in uh, up until recently, what you tend to see is that um, bond prices and stock prices are negatively correlated to one another, meaning that uh, as interest rates go up, uh, bond prices go down and stock prices actually go up. And the reason for that is typically in deflationary environments when uh, the central banks, or in this case, the Fed are raising rates, uh, it's because they're raising rates because uh, growth is um, is going very strong and they're trying to keep it from overheating. And so generally speaking, equity markets look at that as a positive uh, trend higher uh, because of the strong growth. And that's great in the, in the environment of a 60-40 portfolio because you get that diversification uh, naturally between equity and fixed income through uh, that the differences in, in stock and bond correlations. Uh, the problem occurs in inflationary environments, which we, we're experiencing right now, in that stock and bond prices are positively correlated to one another, meaning that as interest rates go up, bond prices go down, but stock prices also go down. And the reason for this is that uh, the reason why central banks ra are raising rates is not because of growth, it is because of inflation, uh, which is a uh, negative for, for equity markets. So that same diversification that you benefit you get uh, in a deflation env environment, generally speaking, historically has not been there in inflationary environments. And so that adds a level of stress to the portfolio. Uh, and, and so that's something that our clients have been struggling with, and we're helping them uh, compensate for that. And really, a lot of that comes from a product fulfillment standpoint. Uh, and, and when it comes to income-seeking investors, one of the things that we've turned to is, is talking more about dividend-paying stocks uh, and, and, and portfolios that include that when you're seeking for income and not focusing solely on yield. The reason for that is historically, uh, dividends do well in high and rising interest rate environments. In fact, uh, in each of the last five interest rate hike cycles, dividend stocks have outperformed the broad market by 12% or more over the full uh, cycle of, of, of those hikes. So uh, that's something to be expected. Uh, and it's something that uh, we would see, it, you know, that historically holds true as we look at the environment today. Uh, and then at the same time, even though yields are, are, are 
are coming in higher, uh, generally speaking, from a dividend standpoint, a dividend dividends are still uh, attractive, uh, and you're still able to earn two to four percent dividend yield, uh, which is competitive with the fixed income uh, side of the business. Okay. So you have advocated for a long time for investors to focus on dividend payers with strong balance sheets. In this environment, I assume this is still an area of focus for you? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and when we look at, uh, you know, balance sheets, again, the reason why we, we focus on strong balance sheets or, or quality uh, in, in, in all periods uh, with dividend paying stocks is because really for us, it's the best way to evaluate a company and gain confidence that the company can continue to pay that dividend, that dividend and potentially grow that dividend over time. And when we talk about quality and, and financial strength, we're essentially doing it over three different uh, lenses that we evaluate a company on. The first one being management efficiency. So we're focusing on uh, the capital deployment and the financing decisions of that company. So uh, things like CapEx scaled by sales. So if CapEx is increasing and sales are increasing, that would be fine. But if CapEx is increasing and sales are not keeping pace, uh, that could be a red flag. Same thing with external financing decisions. Are they uh, issuing more debt? Are you issuing more, more equity? Are you buying back shares? All of that weighs into that equation. Uh, the other thing that's really important that, that we do is we look at all of these by, on a sector by sector basis, because obviously when you look at a utility company versus a technology company, you're talking about two different capital structures, two different ways that those companies are financed. So, you know, our view is that there's quality companies in all sectors. And so we're evaluating that. And so we build our quality score on, on a sector neutral basis by, by evaluating each one uh, sector by sector uh, across the, the different lenses. Uh, so that's management efficiency. Uh, profitability would be the second lens that we use that, that lens. We're looking at how, um, how much of a moat is based around that company. You know, uh, how strong are profit margins? How strong are, or is return on equity on that company? We find those companies that are, have the most robust uh, positioning from profit margin or from an ROE perspective tend to be the uh, the best to weather storms like we're, we're experiencing today because their margins are higher uh, as costs increase and maybe sales maintain or, uh, un or, or come in a little below expectations. They're still able, even if those margins come in slightly, they're still uh, in a robust position compared to other companies in their sector that might not have as strong of a position. Uh, and then finally, the third stage, uh, the third lens we look at is, is through cash flow, you know, because the view is that if companies don't have uh, enough cash on hand to meet their day to day liquidity needs and their debt, uh, their short term debt obligations, then that dividend becomes at risk and the, and the company could really uh, suffer. Uh, we saw this during the financial crisis. We saw this again th during the COVID pandemic. A lot of times we see that uh, dividend strategies overlook. Uh, free cash flow as a piece of that uh, evaluation process for dividend paying companies. Uh, and I think that's an oversight. And that's one of the things that we look for in our processes to have dedicated uh, evaluation of the cash flow in addition to the profitability and uh, the, the aggressiveness of the capital expenditures. Great. Well, what are some considerations investors should be conscious of when exploring dividend strategies. Yeah, uh, so, but start off by saying, you know, focusing on strong balance sheet is one thing that I think investors should be looking at, uh, both in uh, periods of stress like we're in now or in, in, in strong periods. Uh, additionally, you know, one of the things we believe in is uh, being compensated for the risk you are taking. So when it comes to dividend strategies, uh, strategies that um, are that are built to be sector neutral, or if you're looking at it from an international standpoint, country and regional neutral, uh, we value that more than uh, some of the dividend strategies that take large uh, large sector, sector bets in their portfolio. The reason for that is that over the long run, those tend to offset each other over time. So you're, you're really just adding noise to the system. Now, I'll say that if you know, looking through the first uh, four and a half months this year, obviously, if you had large bets to energy or utilities, 
uh, you were rewarded for that uh, over the first couple of months. But historically, that has not been uh, an area of of outperformance. And we would expect that to mean revert over time. So, uh, you know, our, our belief is to be as sector neutral and as country neutral as possible. Uh, the other thing that, that allows us to do is, is offer similar products with uh, variants of varying beta exposures. You know, our, our quality uh, dividend product in the US QDF uh, targets a beta similar to the starting universe, but that allows us to also have a defensive and dynamic strategy. Obviously today, our clients are more focused on the defensive strategy, which has a, a that targets a beta of 15 to 20% lower than the starting universe. So having a defensive strategy uh, in the dividend space is something that today a lot of our investors are, are focused on in addition to the, the base strategy. Okay. Well, thank you, Chris. We appreciate your insights and look forward to chatting you with you again soon. Thanks, Aaron. Pleasure to be here.